the Extinction Agenda, comics of the 80s, 90s, and more. So yeah, this is, uh, yeah, we're here. This is the inaugural, uh, so the christening of the Extinction Agenda a podcast where James and James get together and talk about uh, X-Men and, and some other stuff. Uh, whatever, you know, whatever the four-sided die say. We're the two guys with the four-sided die. Uh, James, you told me once that your first memory of the X-Men was from uh, the, the first Jim Lee X-Men book uh, with, with um, Chris Claremont. Correct. It was from a, a corner store environment. In <laughs> right. Cyclops's flat crotch. Jim Lee's Good. epic <laughs> art was the first thing to catch my eye. Uh, ripe 12 years old. And, right. Uh, yeah. We in yeah, James shortly James. after that. And James then after James. that, we we got the uh, the blah 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 the um, the animated series, and and X Men pretty much became right. a household thing. A household staple. Yeah. So uh, for me, first X Men memory is is the end of the Extinction Agenda. Uh, X Factor sixty two, uh, which which kind of brings us to the you know the reason I I picked this as our first story. Um, also, it's uh, it's a fucking mess, as I'm sure you remember. And um, you also mentioned originally the glory of the Havoc cover with the uh, yeah. It really, I don't think that was necessarily what drew me to it, but uh, it certainly didn't hurt. Didn't um, hurt. It it was definitely better than the Bogdanov art in the in like when I opened it up. It was uh, it was kind of a shock, uh, but I didn't know was, any better. I was I was probably ten. And you were like, this is a comic, and it's great. Yeah, that's right. I was like, wow, what's happening? Uh, so, uh, you know, I made you read this. What's What was your kind of first impression going in? Uh, f- uh, first overall impression, I, I actually made a note right beside the title that says mm-hmm. overall perviness. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. That's real, totally fair. Right? A really creepy, uh, mm-hmm. real all horror vibe even though it was kind of conveyed as like a, a pop art kind of thing because of the mm-hmm. i think that's because of the coloring they used at the time and because of the comics code um kind of muting violence and blood they wanted to tell a darker story and they i think they still achieved that but it's uh, overall was a really creep show uh, yeah. yeah it's it's pretty fucked up you know like i've um i've said in the past that uh you know it's it's basically about a manipulative spider god who runs a an apartheid state who tricks terrorists into attacking him and then captures them and makes them fight each other in a pit uh, uh that's pretty much what happens yeah uh it's it's an interesting thing for for someone to be doing well, it's, it was. It, I didn't even really like. I, I know you. You mentioned the uh, the fact that he did like some type of a, a, a demonic uh, a deal. Yeah, uh, packed, to, to, yeah, to yeah. Come this type of like a mortal god creature, but I I didn't identify him as that. He was so revenge driven, and and he was just such a like a grotesque organic uh, like mechanical organic creature that I I just. He's just like a like an awful villain that you just couldn't wait for somebody to put down. You know. Yeah, he, they did a really excellent job of making him really hateable. Like, yeah, yeah. Cameron Hodge. Uh, yes, the villain Cameron Hodge. You couldn't empathize with him. He couldn't be negotiated with. He even I think even the people that were working with him eventually started to to to, to feel like slighted as if they'd made a horrific mistake. Kind of like Donald Trump supporters. Ah, <laughs> uh, come on. Oh, actually, That's no. I, actually, I got, <laughs> I got something. I got something to say about that, though. Actually, because um, <laughs> the uh, the the Genosian president, uh, when Bogdanov draws her, it's a it's a mix match of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Uh, <laughs> Don't have- woman yes yeah that's a, it's it's an awful and that's it's not an awful, like a god awful it's woman. not an accident that. either no it's they, they did that purposeful. on purpose i like yeah. it so i don't think the, that comment's necessarily out of line uh, at least not oh, like, hey, I, 
yeah. Still though, they uh, yeah. Geographically, like uh, we're we're not we're not really affiliated anyway, so. Yeah, we can that's say true. those we, things. We're not a. <laughs> that's right. We're not an East African republic, so. Or in, in the U.S. That's true too. That's now they know where to find us somewhere else other than the U.S. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I uh, I was always a huge fan of uh, of this story because because for me it was it was a chance for the X Men to. Uh, it was one of the few times where it seemed they were actually attacking systematic injustice uh instead of just you know fucking dealing with magneto um or, or having some sort of heart to heart with with creatures in a tunnel you know something like that it uh. it, it was just uh, yeah right <laughs> um so you know it's a late period thing where you get the for me yeah i don't know it's kind of a stupid story it's a shame that it didn't go off so well but it was an excellent opportunity no, no it it did go it did it went as well as it could at the time and the way that they were trying to bridge uh, sales across books and 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 and, sh- and show the uh, you know get people to buy different titles you know mm-hmm. was part of the part of the draw i guess you know what if i if i don't pick up the next issue of x factor i'm not going to not going to have the complete story you know, which is a, is a, it's a, a, mar- a little bit of marketing, you know, stuff like that. But it, it was a good story, great overall ideas, um, you know, uh, dehumanizing of prisoners, and um, it, was, it was it was solid. That's and good. Then, That's like what you we said, <laughs> <laughs> like you said too, the it was the first like one of the one of the better times that the X Men were actually like shown as a like almost like a like a militarized group. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they. Uh, they they kind of like went off as a tactical team. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. so, so you in the collection that you read. So when I, when I prepared for this uh, episode, I only read the the nine issues through Uncanny X Men, New Mutants, and X Factor. But yes. the collection that you have has those older things where Genosha's first uh, introduced. Um, yeah, and they they, they use the the. Um, what the gene guy? I I keep forgetting it. The the gene engineer. The gene engineer. Yes, yeah. they use the gene engineer as a as a primary villain, um, mm-hmm. and uh, him and his uh, his agenda was was uh, I guess a little more tame. He was he was running the country uh, as a kind of an independent state, and he was using the mutants as labor, and he was making them very prosperous. Um, the, he was obviously like dehumanizing the mutants and he was using them for like sexless breeding and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and he had a very, like, he castrated them basically with these suits that he was putting on them. And that, mm-hmm. that was all kind of played out in an earlier arc. And then, um, they, they, they had a rogue and Wolverine arc that was quite, quite violent and, and they were kind of like hopelessly battling against, uh, up, up an uphill team of evil uh, and that's when mm-hmm. the, the the gene engineer's uh, son was introduced as a as a part of the story um yeah i haven't read him in a long who is yeah sorry and he was someone who was ignorant to the what they were doing to the mutants uh, yeah and, and he that, sort of defects if i remember or he, or he tries to get his yeah, girlfriend's yeah, son actually, out I, or something like that i think yeah i think he actually succeeds in in, in kind of a way but the, but the gene engineer had a family in an in a, in a, a like a dark agenda, but he was definitely like more of a humanized villain than than the, the, the sort of insane one that they brought into the, the arc that we read after. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when Rogue and Wolverine working together, and and you know, I'll say this now. I'll I'll, I'll likely say it again this very episode. Uh, Chris Claremont had only like. He just likes to go back to the well on things, and this will be the second time that Rogue and Wolverine go behind enemy lines and, uh, you know, have a mission together where one of them's like almost dying. Um, you know, maybe we'll get to cover it later, but this one's really interesting. Uh, that uh, you know, like they they end up losing their powers. Um, yeah, um, it's specifically uh, that was the one of the hinges was which was actually a, a pretty pitiful uh, delivered 
sort of plot point was that they just had a fat guy with a mustache that like buzz after your powers are gone. That's right, wipe out. Fucking wipe uh, out. I literally wiped out your powers, and that's my fucking yeah, that's... gift. And I'm completely yeah. like, no one ever attacks or kills me, and my 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 wipe out of your powers is not permanent. But I'm the only one that can reverse it. That's and I would like to stupid. point out. Uh, yeah, I'd like yeah. to point out that without Wipeout, this entire story is impossible. Um, <laughs> and someone should assassinate him immediately. Yeah, that's a that's a really, really soft uh, way to, to drive your plot and to yeah. put your mutants in danger by just, like, taking away their powers. Not to mention that they're, like, like Wolverine's a specially trained assassin. So, like, having his powers wiped out, he probably still could have cut through. 10 or 15 armed guys and murdered the wipeout, which really should have been the end of this whole thing. But yeah, I would have I liked to... I, they, <laughs> they, they, they cover this, but like he's basically got a... Like, he's got rebar for a skeleton. Uh, he weighs hundreds of pounds. Um, right. He, uh, if he hit you, it would be so fun. Even if he didn't use his claws, he would just fucking punch right through you. It would be disgusting. It'd be um, so bad. It'd be, it'd be. It'd be. It's not. It wouldn't even just be like being hit by a metal object. It would be like there'd be like weight and 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 heavy muscle behind it, and it'd be like being hit with like multiple pounds of of, of steel. It yeah. would be like there'd be broken bones, broken jaws, just on a single punch. You you, you would not. You'd not even. It would take you. You'd have to go for surgery. There'd be months to recover from even being <laughs> punched in the face. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of medical bills attached to that guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, Wolverine's loss of power. Thought it was great. Um, I think opening up with a like a high powered character, like an invincible character, making him an mm-hmm. instant dead weight liability. Super great. Mm-hmm. It, it it created a sense of urgency. Also made all the other characters seem kind of limp-wristed. Uh, nobody really knew what to do. They were they seemed weak. Uh, uh, I don't know. It, it was a nice move. Uh, and then also there was a, a rape. Well, it was implied that Rogue was raped or molested. And then they kind of... I know they do the comics code of things, so they kind of glazed over it as if like mm-hmm. a guard like grabbed her butt or something. And that that's what sent her into a uh, like some kind of... like. Uh, like coma state where uh, Carol took over her mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, that, but I, I, I'm in an, in reality. Let's face it. They they wanted to write it as a as she was raped by the guards. Yeah, and Claremont does a lot of that. Like he's got a lot of. Um... But it was going to be a really dark story, and I know they kind of glazed over it. But I thought they did a good job keeping like you know the older audience. If you were reading that and you were older, you knew what they were going for. Oh, for sure. And 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 like I was going to say, uh, Claremont, and we'll, we'll get lots of chances to talk about this. But he often, uh, this isn't equivalent, but he he has a lot of. If you pay attention, there's a lot of sex uh, in X Men comics. There's a lot of like even even homosexual relationships that are just sort of hinted at, but never explicitly stated. Uh, yeah. Not that that's the equivalent of rape, but it's in that ballpark. It's in that like. Um, well, it's in if for the for the time frame. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it was it was it was more forward and 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 more advanced for reading to to have those kind of relationships go on or those kind of instances happen, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, but and this anyway. is what drew people to it. You know? so, yeah. So also the weird so, teenage storm that was that she was a child uh, that was bizarre. I'm not sure what they were going for or how that added to it, but. This is a lot of, um, you know, this is going to come up, you know, whenever we talk about Claremont, I'm, I'm going to pause it right now to anyone listening that Claremont probably only has five ideas. And he spent 18 years just doing variations on these same ideas. And one of the, the themes, one of the things that he just keeps coming back to is, is body modification and uh, as well as mind control. Uh, these these two things are are central to all almost all of his narratives, um, and and Ro, uh, Storm in particular gets gets battered around a lot, uh, and so this is another instance where he was like, I'm just going to turn her into a young girl again, uh, and now then he has to deal with it. 
And at the time, Marvel editorial was saying, no, no, we have to get the X-Men back to normal because uh, you've spent far too much time doing weird stuff with them. Uh, and Jim Lee was pushing in that direction as well. That's why you end up with X-Men number one, where, where like the team right. is back together. Yeah, and uh, I did I did feel like also the, the children in the book were uh, uh, sexualized uh, quite a bit. Uh, e- e the younger, uh, like the teenagers. Which was, right, right, the new mutant kids. Yeah, yeah. that was odd. Uh, odd choice, you know. I mean, I guess maybe if you were trying to appeal to a teenage crowd, which I mean, at this time in comics, I'm not even sure what they were, who they were trying to write for, really. Ellen. Well, they were writing for us. I mean, like, I was pretty excited about a skimpy teenage girls back then. That was, oh, definitely. Uh, was... I mean, when you're like 12, 13, and you're allowed to buy a comic book, and you open it up, and the girls are in bikinis, you're like, this is great. And I mean, let's yeah, yeah. Be, let's be, uh, you know, let's not, let's not glaze over it. Yeah, no, and that's that was their audience, you know, this, and, and that's what they were aiming for, and they knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Uh, and... Yeah, it's a little weird now. Looking back, you're like, well, that's a little dicey, but yeah. Whatever. And there was a lot of his dicey themes were all over the place. The um, the 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 fact that once they got these guys captured, and this was Genosha, correct? Yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, they started uh, castrating them, uh, basically with uh, this mind control and these suits. Right, I see. What and you're then like, they like also bonded, yeah. then they also did uh, sexless breeding. Uh, which was like horrific, like gene therapy to create whatever. I don't know. They, they, we didn't even really get any characters out of that. We just sort of got got the idea that they were actually like like test tubing uh, people that had powers they needed. For... Yeah, and and what's interesting about Genosha is that like it's it's really it's a white state. Um, it's it's meant to be South Africa. Uh, or a stand-in for South Africa, but I mean, like, there's only one ever a, a black authority figure, and that's the judge at, at the mock trial. Um, but at the end, of, you know, it's basically a Nazi. Um, it, it might as well be South America, you know, where where they just, uh, you know, yeah. they've they've developed a clean race um, and genetically pure, and then any impurities are put to work in the camps. Uh, but everybody's, you know, everybody's living large on on the fat of the land. Yeah, and even to the point where the um, the general populations a- actually like uh, probably would be uh, in uprise or or uh, opposition to what they're doing, but they're actually uh, left in the dark and and just living off the profit. Yeah, no, and that's an interesting question. Uh, whether or not they know, I mean, there's no indication. Uh, that they it's know. it seems like some of them do, but there, yeah, yeah, there was. I think that, I I feel like the plot uh, touched on some of that with the. Uh, um, uh, there is the, there's the other guy, the the gene uh, the gene guy, the gene engineer, the gene engineer guy. Yeah, his son, yeah. his son. It was implied, not implied. I guess it was it was mm-hmm. um, it was discussed that his son uh, and their family actually had no idea that this was going on. Really, oh, they just okay. thought that 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 these were all uh, volunteers, basically, like people that actually right. wanted to work. For Genosha and the mutants mm-hmm. were just they were like that they were just like that that's that's how they that's how they worked you know they were happy to right. be part of the community and stuff and and they had their own sort of like community where they had their own little houses and then they, they were happy with that kind of almost like a in a, a, a statement against like maybe a statement uh, sort of brushing against uh, communism to where you know hey you have a job and a house we gave that to you you're you're happy to be here, you know, and and maybe that that some children and and uh, and family members uh, sitting around at home just living off the fat of the land, like you say, are, are basically just, um, you know, they're, they're oblivious to it or they don't want to know, really. Yeah, and it might be also equivalent to uh, to slavery. You know, we, we the the propaganda is that like they're happier here. They this is what they want. Uh, you know, we have to keep them in line, but ultimately, at the end of the day, this is the natural order. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of different ways of looking at it and which is which is kind of you know like that's that's another reason this story resonates with me so much because like it's it's so much richer than the than you know magneto shows up and he's he's causing trouble uh like stories like this are yeah yeah. (laughs) stories like this are the reason that x-men is uh is such a value, but you could never do this story with the Avengers um, or, or any of the other uh, superhero properties. Cause you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's something uh, there's room for more depth in the X-Men. Um, 
which is which is what always draws me back to them and and one of the reasons it's kind of a shame that uh they fell off and and these sort of things aren't i don't know they just don't seem as prevalent anymore no i mean uh, well they're not they're not in the, the they're not almost in the stage for like the a lot of people seem to try to structure now for you well everybody's doing that right you structure for money what's the best box yeah, for sure well, you're yeah. looking for the best box office so in in doing that you're you're not you're not looking for like an r-rated this was essentially a horror tale uh, it, yeah for sure yeah rain uh, puts them in a in a pit where they have to fight each other yeah and then rain uh her name's rain right rain yeah 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 she's the um the wolf girl she's, yep yep it's not coming to me. Um, but she, uh, like she had her mind wiped in, in basically like one, it was like a horrific kind of, uh, I thought that was one of the best like horror moments of the, uh, of the book. Uh, yeah. And when, she was when against oh, her God. will turned into a zombie, you know, whatever. Yeah. No. And you think like it's, it's theoretically irreversible. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you didn't, you kind of like, you know, they were playing with it at first and you thought, ah, you know, x-men cable and his team they're, they're gonna break her out of there you know she was there. yeah <laughs> she was the no but you can't stop hodge and the and him putting spikes through your shoulder uh yeah, that was weird that was weird power i guess but yeah yeah he did that a lot. That's, an, that's another thing you were talking about the, the 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 militarization of their team like they went back to base like cyclops mm-hmm. and and some of the, the more powerful uh, mutants on the team they mm-hmm. they fully weaponized and militarized and sent a team to a foreign country. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. super legal. It's terrorism. Yes. No, ex- exactly. I like That's... and and I I wrote down a quote from Cyclops uh, after he finds out that Havoc's involved. He writes, "His presence means that this is more than a straightforward international conflict." Who cares if your brother's there, man? You're in it. Let's get back to that international conflict part. Yeah, you're an international uh, terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> You're just you're invading a sovereign nation in order to I don't know what break out pl- political prisoners, um, oh, and yeah. your, your well, government's I mean, essentially were... disowned you. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, I like that the I did like that scene too, where the the government lady steps in. Val Cooper. Yeah, she says, you know what? We're we're not gonna we're gonna really we're not gonna really gonna help you. Actually, I think they did help a little. Well, they gave some some top secret information. Yeah. Um, did, yeah. did they was I under the impression they gave a bit of a crew as well? I don't no, I don't think there was any crew. Uh you know, the X-Men already had their own flying car, so what more do you need, right? Yeah, and they already had a group of high-powered terrorists, so. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Well-trained terrorists. Actually came He's still there? Completely ineffective. Cable? Yes. Yeah, no, this is uh he was yeah, useless. I, he talked yeah, a they lot did. of shit. Yeah, it was like a big bully. I <laughs> like that. I, no, that's no, that's absolutely right. And I like that Banshee and Forge are essentially equivalent badasses. Like they're not concerned about this loudmouth asshole. That you know, like they've seen it all. Oh man, um, she stepped up to the plate. Yeah. Yeah. No, and he I like that. Like of one of the things that goes missing from the X-Men later is like, because Banshee and Forge were like leading men in the earlier stories. Well, um, they were older and as they were, well, uh, like original yeah, yeah. members. Yeah, yeah, and Banshee's been around since uh, the giant size X-Men, and he, you know, part of Interpol, and he's got a, um, a, what a law enforcement background. Uh, you know, he's really, you know, he doesn't give a fuck about Cable. Uh, Cable's just another one of these guys, one of these like these special forces guys that he's probably seen a million of. Yeah, that that uh, that did detract from any uh, mystique or awesomeness Cable had. I think a little. He hadn't he hadn't fully caught on yet, so they hadn't put their everything behind him. You know, they hadn't turned him into the the child of uh, Gene and Scott. They hadn't like none of that stuff. He was just he was just uh, Rob Liefeld's half-baked idea that was which was dropped on louise simonson against her will oh so they just basically they were like you know what let's just make this guy like a team member that gets swatted away like a... <laughs> yeah they were just like you know and that's um one of the reasons that uh you know louise simonson took off 
is because Marvel kept and it, and it's actually it's the same thing with Chris Claremont, like Jim Lee and Liefeld. These guys were selling books, and so uh, the editors were like, "Well, what do you guys want to do? Uh, who cares what the writers want to do? Let, let's let's keep you happy." Um, well, another so thing lot of- too that's maybe underrated, and when you talk about stuff like this, is like we, mm-hmm. like they they do toy development as well. Like I mean, there's a lot, there's exactly a lot that. of there's a lot of properties here, and when, if these artists have a new idea, I have a new idea. I drew this. It looks yeah. very rich. It's a new character. Yeah. Who gives a yeah. shit where that came from? That's a toy. That's a comic cover. That's a, you know. No, and it's interesting you say that. One of the reasons that uh, when McFarlane was trying to get everybody to join Image, uh, he, the first thing he pointed at to Liefeld was like, look, they made a toy of Cable. Um that's your character. That's your money. You know, like that, that could be yours. Uh, so obviously people want to buy what you're selling. Let's go, let's get out of here. And he's not wrong. Yeah, no, they weren't wrong. And, <laughs> and there's a were. better way to structure it than they were doing it. Right? Yeah. Like there's maybe yeah. collaborating with a writer that you like, huh? Ugh, yeah. Suck ass. <laughs> yeah. Could've, they could have went that way. Sure. Yeah. No, uh, well, <laughs> Um, another thing uh, in there's mind also is, oh. oh sorry no go ahead no 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 you first oh I just was gonna go to the Wolverine dungeon kiss but that's oh okay. please <laughs> let's let's go uh, you want to was that was that in your notes as well no yeah most erotic moment of 1992 the most erotic moment of the extinction agenda the uh, yeah the uh, shot to shit uh, pool of blood on the floor uh, Wolverine <laughs> Jean Grey makeout sesh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did think about that. I was like, God, that's a lot of blood. That was um, ludicrous. Yeah. yeah. I don't know uh, what happened there. Like, Jean's just, like, weak-willed or what. Well, she's always been, uh, not always. I don't know when they introduced the, the Jean-Wolverine sort of romance, but, uh, yeah, that wasn't necessarily there early on. Uh, Wolverine yeah. loved her, but it, there was no indication that, that she felt the same way. Anyway, uh, that yeah. showed up later. Yeah, and I'm, I'm also, for the record, not a fan of treating Wolverine as a weird fucking midget from Canada. Okay, I, go I, on. I, yeah, no, I just don't like that. I don't think it was a. I don't think it. I don't think it adds any stock to his character. I don't know why that's like that. It doesn't. I don't know. Anyway. Well, he was a weird midget from Canada, so. Yeah, I, I guess once you, you got once once you got it, you got to stick with it, right? Yeah, like like the, obviously they ignored it later, but um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, he's like five foot six, and shorter than we are. Yeah, it was like an angry little boy. You figure that would give him less sex appeal, but oh, he should definitely be very unappealing. He should be a very unappealing man. Uh, he's especially covered in a pool of blood. He probably smells awful. Oh yeah, uh, he I mean, has, well, he's been he he'd been fighting uh, militants for what like a week. Uh oh, calls gone out on us. Probably really disgusting. Open wounds. Mm. Uh yeah. Oh, the calls know. back. Sorry, mine chopped a little bit there. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah, I didn't. That's okay. You. Yeah. The uh. Yeah. Yeah, Wolverine without his powers, like you were saying earlier, is is very interesting. Um, Claremont wanted to kill Wolverine in issue, like, he was building up to it. In issue, like, he wanted to do it in X-Men 300. Why? Um, well, because he was killing characters, you know, like, he, you know, he killed Jean Grey. He, he, for him, like, this, he wanted everyone to grow and pass away and move on and... Uh, Cyclops was never supposed to come back to the X-Men. He was never supposed to be an X-Factor. Uh, you know, a lot of this comes from editorial. That's interesting. Yeah, so he this was all part of that. That's why he's all sick and weak, and his healing factor is not working as well. Didn't um, like him. He, he loved him, but, you know, it, he needed with this character. Because when he's got all of his powers and stuff, you're right. He's just like this invincible killing machine and and i think he'd told all the stories he was going to tell with them yes yeah, it's, it's it's a bore to have him tear through everybody you, you know you're not gonna get any depth until you see him like try and make a move on cyclops's wife uh yeah in a bloody battered <laughs> state he's a slime bag 
Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, admittedly, he's about to die, theoretically. So I guess we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you're going to give uh, him a pass on that? Okay, that's fine. Well, I, I, I put up with a lot. <laughs> I put up with a lot in the X-Men. The, uh, another thing I've seen in my notes is, uh, and I thought it was unique, but we'll, we're going to get a chance to talk about it again later. I was going to talk about the use of, uh, of media, the use of, like, like basically... Um, broadcast news cnn yeah, essentially. That was a, i, I want to say that was a big 80s thing well it is an 80s thing like cnn Being i looked like it up a, I was, showing things on the news when you're telling a story well i thought it was an 80s thing but again we're going to go back when we go to older claremont stories and it, it it's actually a thing he's been doing uh from the beginning huh. um and uh i think he does it he does it during specific stories he does it when he wants everything to seem big when he when he when it's like a really big story he'll he'll pull in the media he'll have uh, news reports in the background um it did feel like a post dark knight returns thing yeah uh, i I, is... I do like that though i like that i liked it in dark knight returns i liked it in robocop i like mm-hmm. the use of it 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 does it does give a it shows with where it shows where the mass media perspective on the situation is uh, so that yeah. like you're you're not just siding with the X Men and saying like oh X Men are good these guys are evil you get to see what's being given to the people for information. Yeah, yeah, it builds the world for you, um, and uh, yeah, it, it helps things. So I I thought it was a usual an unusual narrative device, but it turns out uh, like we're going to see later it's it's not so unusual at all. Uh, hmm. the, the, that um, it, that's also one of the things that that kind of didn't get the media kind of part where you didn't see that there was a how did that partnership between Hodge and Genosha start where did where were they like this guy's going to take us to the next level yeah none of that stuff's in there um and and I don't think it's in any comics I think it just kind of they just threw it in which which again I kind of like because I guess if I had to guess here's here's my guess at the secret history of Cameron Hodge's relationship with Genosha so Hodge a human supremacist underground um, terror organization. Uh, you know, perhaps he sought safe harbor in uh, in an apartheid state. Uh, you know, uh, after his defeat uh, slash beheading, um, and then somewhere in there, you know, he he got a big scorpion body. I don't know when he made a deal uh, with the devil to be immortal. Um, that probably exists somewhere, but I have no clue. Um, hopefully we'll find it later when we go into some X-Factor comics. He was really difficult to fight. Yeah. Uh, they pretty much had to like, um, God, how did they, basically they blew his body apart and ripped his face in half and buried him under a building. Started like adapting techniques to deal with the phasing, how he phased out of the room whenever he'd lose a fight too. That was fucking annoying. (laughs) Yeah. He was very overpowered. Um, but again, yeah. uh, this this notion of demonic forces and these these demon bodies, uh, this too is is one of Claremont's five ideas, uh, and uh, we're going to see a lot of that as well, where where demons are just like the uh, are are more ex- extremely prevalent and uh, very part of the X Men franchise. Yeah, that um, you know what else is part of the X Men franchise? Uh, oh. The uh, Gambit's uh, sexual assault during the fight. How about that? Oh yeah, when he kissed that girl. Yeah, he does a lot of non-consensual like, kissing. Gave her like a gave her like a non-consensual kiss in the middle of a <laughs> fist fight. Which, by the way, um, uh-huh. I feel like swayed her to sympathy toward the X Men. Oh, you think he really touched her? I'm thinking non-consent turned into consent. That's wow, not just like that's that. not that's not that's not nice or. The way things should be done, however. But, but. <laughs> in that case, that's what happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there which it is. I, there, yeah. Which is Poor not man's cool. Got really yeah, stupid. But. Yeah, and then, I mean, you know how she you... kind of rallied against uh, the bad guys at the end with them? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. She fell in love. I guess. It's a theory. We'll put it on the maybe pile. Could be one of Gambit's mutant powers, though. It definitely is. At this point, he nobody knows. Yeah, you're right, because the next time we see her. Uh, she's she's hustling Storm along. That's right. Uh, and, yeah. Mm, she's, was she, was, she was she was their number one gun runner, and then all of a sudden she's what sympathetic <laughs> to the bad guys. 
I don't know. I'm I sure there's know. some dialogue in there that, that uh, counter X that, but for now I'm going to go with that theory. Can't yeah, but you run it. You run that, because that's what happened. That's he a power. Her in the X-Men. We can go back, brush over, you know, latent powers later. Yeah. Well, yeah, because at this point it's not really worked out what his deal is, so maybe super kissing is, now, is in there. I wrote down also Die Hard and then the name Psylocke. Oh, yeah, because she's in the... Did she yeah. crawl through some tunnels? She did. She crawled through the ducts and, and said, Bruce Willis, eat your heart out. Yes. Right. Yes. There also was uh, the Beast reference to Iron Maiden. Yeah. yeah a lot of good... Uh, a lot of good <laughs> Pop culture <laughs> references. Yeah. The number of the Beast. Uh, we you should talk like about Bogdanov. I did like what? that. I'm looking at it right now. We should talk about uh, Bogdanov. John Bogdanov, the artist. The artist, oh. I use that with a capital A. Yeah, he's in my notes here too. The good, the bad, the ugly I wrote. Right. So I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a defense of uh, John Bogdanov. because uh, because I think he's much better than than what little Liefeld contributes to this story. Uh, they even had to have a fill in artist for Liefeld. Um, yeah, that's not great. They had Yap come in. And it's funny to see early Yap. Because we see him later in like extreme comics and stuff, doing um, uh, well. God, I young blood probably. Ugh. The, anyway. um, yeah, he. You know what? I hated his art, and I found yeah. it really jarring. However, yeah. I think in yeah. like a sequential art, like uh, um, kind of a like like in a comic book art setting, he <laughs> he he did have a good narrative like he drove the the progression of the story like i didn't get lost in the art like i went frame to frame with no issue i mean you know if that says anything even though he kind of had like an ugly stylistic thing going on for himself uh it, it's because it, it differs so much from uh, anyone else that participated in in the story that that i think that was maybe what made it jarring it wasn't actually bad no, I think so. It's a bad fit because you've got two individuals who are really influenced. Like, like, I don't know. well, Liefeld. I don't know what his influences are. Manga, um, and then Jim Lee's definitely like, uh, what do we want to call it? Naturalism. And then Bogdanov. He's a cartoonist. Yeah, uh, his yeah. characters are all, you know, and, and he he does emotion really well. He does like actual character really well, uh, but he's not an action artist. His face expressions were good. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the other thing too. Is when entering in the early, the early uh, section with the um, <laughs> uh, Wolverine and and Rogue uh, arc, they um, uh, that was uh, Mark Silvestri, who I find to be very similar to Jim Lee. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely uh, so. like. Uh, I'd be very surprised if Jim Lee wasn't looking at what Liefeld was up to. I'd... There's enough to there's enough to transition from from Silvestri to Jim Lee. Uh, sometimes <laughs> you may not even I find I don't even notice it. Uh, they're both very skilled and they both have this, a similar style. Uh, right. But, but then when you and even yeah. Liefeld, I mean, yeah, I'd, I, he's terrible. I mean, like I'm I'm sure we're gonna touch on more of him someday. Oh yeah, yeah. Those old X Force comics. You're gonna. Have, I'm gonna definitely gonna be assigning that one day. Yeah, I know. Those are, like, those I are like, excellent. If you gave him like a month to draw a poster, you're probably okay. But yeah, fuck. He's so bad. <laughs> they actually, um, in the, the Deadpool movie, he made a joke about him not being able to draw feet. Oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, I, it's it's a very inside joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one's gonna get that. That's hilarious. Uh, so, any any final thoughts on Extinction Agenda or anything else that you wanted to touch um, on? No, I, th I, th I that was like my my kind of like once over of the whole thing. Um, right. I, I, I did. I really liked the villain. He was really over the top. Um, and then I, ju I just kind of thought it dragged and it, it was like, like sections of it were kind of like retold for, mm -hmm. um, yeah. But other than that, I mean, it was a, it's a great story. It, it's, it had a lot, a lot of over the tarp, uh, over the top dark stuff. It, it was, it was a horror mm -hmm. story for me kind of, but 
That's great. No, I think I think that's actually a great way of thinking of it. Um, uh, yeah. So so basically, remember a, a lot of that stuff. Remember uh, Extinction Agenda, because because yeah, it, when we do other when, when we do other Claremont stuff, we're we're gonna we're gonna see echoes. Uh, and and see how his later work is is pretty much a manifestation of, of his early work. Um, but uh, if you don't have anything to say, we can move on to uh, Chuck Watch. Yes, I am good for that. Or Dixon Watch. So uh, Chuck Watch is a is a feature that we're going to be doing from time to time, where we look closely at the works of uh, Chuck Dixon, uh, prolific uh, comics writer of the. I guess '90s and 2000s, and you know, I guess even up until today, to a limited extent. Uh, one thing that I wanted to say, because uh, I love Chuck Dixon. Do you love Chuck Dixon? I, I really like a lot of his stories. I don't, I don't know why. Um, yeah. I don't, and I, I guess we're eventually we're going to get to the bottom of why. Like, what, what, what yeah. makes what makes his superhero so appealing? Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the magic sauce in the in the in the Chuck Burger, um, <laughs> and and then at the same time, when when we're trying to figure out why we really like the Chuck Dixon, we, you know, we also personally, I would like to figure out why he's uh, why he's such an asshole in the present day. Uh, Chuck Chuck's uh, doing some work for a, a prominent white nationalist right now. Um, and uh, he's un- unapologetic about it. He's, he's a matter of fact, is sort of enthusiastic and defensive about anyone who, who calls him out on this. And uh, it's very disappointing. And Chuck can go fuck himself. Um, I, but I think uh, he's living anyway. in kind of a fantasy world, and I think he's lost some ground to being senile, um, if I had to guess. Uh, but, I mean, he, he's also like a living nightmare. Yeah, in real life, and I'm not really sure. Uh, and it's it, interesting it, you li- oh go on no nah, it just it just sucks uh to take something that somebody's done and have it be like tainted by that uh, but anyway yeah, yeah and this is the time this is the age we're living in right now where like you know don't t- look too closely at your heroes because uh probably they rape someone yeah, um, yeah I, I guess yeah this was information about people and about things that are going on in the world that i mean pre-internet era you wouldn't even have ever gotten that information no and that's exactly and that's a, something that chuck says in interviews nowadays he's just like i've always been this way but you know the internet just exposed me um because i listened to him on a, a conservative radio internet uh interview um I don't know. He claims he's been blacklisted, but that's bullshit. I, you know, it just, you know, he basically all the people who used to hire him died or got out of the business, and then everyone was. I like, wouldn't well, be surprised if he was. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he was blacklisted, though. I mean, like, if I'm running Marvel Studios or I have anything to do with their comic production or whatever, I'd be like, you want to hire who? Yeah, no. Well. <laughs> well, and now I'm not surprised. Like two years ago, like the last work that he did was for DC. He did that Bane Conquest story. Uh, right. That was in, uh, it ended August of 2018. Uh, so he's, you know, he, he's he's getting some work, but he's just not the guy that everybody's calling because the guy's a hack. Um, he's a good and, hack, but but he's a hack. Yeah, he's, he. Uh, but I mean, like the other thing, like, uh, not, not defending him as a person, but defending his actual like writing style. Um, he's yeah. from an era where these guys were just drone writing serialized books. Like, we, for sure, we need yeah, you to plow. He's... We need you to plow through a hundred issues of Batman. No worries, I got some ideas. Whatever. And the, the <laughs> you know the amount sure. of mediocre books that got pumped out. You know. There's some awesome stuff in between, but it wasn't all awesome, that's for sure. And so, speaking of what some awesome stuff in between, uh, today we're going to talk about Detective Comics 700, published in August of 1997, yes. uh, illustrated by Graham Nolan. Who is uh, it? And a real G, by the way. He is great. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he doesn't do anything anymore, because like, all you really need to do is look at a picture of him, uh, and you're like, oh, he's an asshole. Uh, oh yeah, well that makes sense. <laughs> so, so I think, I think because I can't find any recent work that he's done. Um, so you know maybe he decided to make money somewhere else, but I don't know. Um, he he gives me a bad vibe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that you judged him on. I like that you judged a book by its cover, but 
he's good. He was good. I'm totally here. judging a book. Oh, it's coming. Yeah, he was great. Uh, so, so what did you think of Detective Comics seven hundred? Rereading it. Um, just opened up to Ra's al Ghul's stupid preaching. He was on it. He just went on a tirade. Uh, this, I was like, wow, this is dumb. Uh, but then it, it really picked up. I like the artwork. The artwork's great. The Graham Nolan does these like close-ups on faces that are kind of interesting. Um, that, that you don't see a lot in in comic book art, and right. it, it, he it was kind of like a, a shocking book to kind of go through, but it, it was it was well done. And then Batman kind of took over, and then it got cool. Yeah, w- one of the things that I uh, my first note is like uh, fast pace. I mean, like there's a lot of good action in this book. It's pretty much beginning to end, double sized. Uh, everyone's doing something, or, and when they're not doing something, they're like. Like you said, with uh, race, they're they're giving some sort of megalomaniacal speech, uh, you know, basically giving us the plot or, or telling us what the stakes are. Yeah, right. And then also, Russell Gould had a a, a racial goal. He, he had a, he had a ab, like a disregard for actually stopping Batman, which was weird. Yeah, at this point, you, when you you probably shouldn't send your goons after him. You should assume that your goons goons are going to fail. At at, the, at that point, in con, like knowing that you've confronted uh, Batman in the past, you should yeah. really be terribly concerned that he's going to plow through a lot of what, what you've got out here. Um, yeah, yeah, little like he or no up, effort. You should be like, yeah, you should be like, oh fuck, the detective. Uh, yeah, but, he you just know, seemed like, oh no, I got this. This is on. Yeah, it's in the bag. He's just, no, I'm just gonna. Which seems like idiotic. Boys it and, seems. And, like, a little out of character for him, but maybe he was over. Um, he he might have been overconfident that Bane really was was at the point where he could bail him out if need be. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, my sense, you know, like looking at the plot, looking at the the dialogue and everything, like it's sold that race. Uh, all he needs to do is finish getting the uh, the riddle of Eritreus, uh, getting all that that that. Uh, DNA information, and then if he escapes, then Batman can't stop him. Yeah, uh, he had a horrific plan. He was planning on plague, plague murdering the general population of Earth down to about ten percent, right? Yeah, yeah, that's always been his. But more than that, what the um, fuck? He, well, okay, so so I, I I don't know what this riddle of Eritreus is. I I googled Eritreus. I don't know what that is, and it's never showed up in any other book. So it's just another. It's just Dixon gobbledygook. Um, but, uh, race says that it's going to give him access quote to the very structure of life on every level of existence. You're just going to make a virus. You're just going to like, think about that very structure of life in every level of existence. One, I don't know what that means. And then two, no. you're just going to kill everybody with that. Yeah. How do you plan on surviving? That's my big question. Oh, oh well, he's going to modify it to account for intelligence and docility. Um, well, I don't know. He's maybe he'll do wear a mask or something. But basically, yeah, he's smarter. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Good move. Um, uh, he, also, uh, the, I guess the pain wasn't actually pain; was a big reveal, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, he's uncharacteristically subservient, and, and super also, he, yeah, he's very horny. Yeah, and and he was oh yeah, that was bad. He's really looking to get that that wife in the bag. Yeah, he's just like Dahlia. Now we can be together. Wow, yeah. Like, and then he had the Spanish accent and the uh, lucha oh. mask, uh, which I guess was a, a Dick Chuck's creation. So. That's a... And I would like to and and Chuck said something interesting about the Bane mask that because I've always thought it was a stupid costume. Uh, up until like a week ago, and I still kind of think it is, but but he was right that it gives Bane a distinctive look uh, in a way that you can really put him in anything whatsoever, but once you see the bat mask, you know the character. It's like the bat symbol. It's his equivalent of the bat symbol. Uh, it's so effective that even Graham Nolan, uh, or uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, could, uh, could make use of it and uh, yeah, just make a character out of it. Right. Um, can you yeah. hang on one sec? Mm. No. That's it's the, it's Chuck. Chuck's fucking with us. Thanks for that. Yeah, um, maybe his fucking the spirit of his sh- fucking shitty attitude. It's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
so so I want to get back briefly to the race thing, uh, to the Ra's yeah. al Ghul thing and his and his idea. So he wants to and I and I want to I want to tie it in to Chuck's assholeness, uh, Dixon's uh, recent turn, because uh, I because I'm going to posit that a, a character in a book is only as smart as the writer can make them. You know, can only create actions that the writer has the imagination to envision. Um, oh, okay. And so. so so Chuck's, you know, so Chuck's version of Rachel Ghoul is capable, like in Chuck's universe, it's capable to make a virus that can account for intelligence and docility, uh, which implies that in his imagination that these things are genetic, um, uh, which implies that Chuck's a racist. Um, it, it, I'm not saying that because well, that would be lawless. Uh, um, well, I mean, it kind of is. Well, yeah. Ah, it does seem it, you know, and, the, and then he has raised world order, uh, which is part of culture. Uh, and uh, and he's got a, you know, like man's natural state of suspicion, brutality and raw survival. And, and you kind of get a sense like if any of this is any way a reflection of, of Chuck's sort of darker uh, uh, mind, then then you can see echoes of, of what may come later. Um uh, I'm just I'm, I'm going to keep my eye out for little things like these and see whether or not we can build a universe from uh, uh, Chuck's kind of habits. Yeah, um, I, I mean, if, if Chuck himself is responsible for saying that these were things that were on his mind uh, uh, throughout his entire life and career, then, I mean, you, you should be able to pick up glimpses of them in, in his work and, and see that it's obvious that he has some, that he wants to talk about it in some back alley way kind of yeah i think so i mean i don't i don't know the extent of he just calls himself the conservative guy um and you know and i get the impression that he's definitely a second amendment nut um but i, I don't know what else that means and and it's difficult to figure that out but um anyway so so that was just something some stuff that jumped out to me but you know um, who knows yeah the um, did you also notice that that you talked about the pace of the book earlier? Uh, Batman yeah, was yeah. very fast at tasking, also had no regard for Dick's safety. Really felt like Nightwing was gonna have to f fucking take care of himself. And well, he let him. And I actually, I kind of wrote in my thing that that was cool. I like that Night Nightwing got it, but some nice moments. Like he doesn't worry too much about him. And uh, and at the end of the episode, he, you know, he does show concern. He, he calls him son. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but yeah, in, realistically, Batman also had to prevent Robin from dying. So yeah, he, he, he kind of had he some did, heavy baggage. He did have to put some some. Uh, his main focus was basically uh, he actually had to get Robin out of that scenario alive. He he might have brought Robin into a bit of a hot spot. He probably would have been better off on his own or just with Dick. I think so. We actually, you're making a strong argument. Um, I'd like to read the episode issue before that brought us to this. Maybe there's a good reason that Robin's there. Um, but yeah, he's kind of useless. It seemed like maybe he just like got into like I don't know. I'm gonna give I'm gonna I'm gonna give Batman's thought train a go. It just maybe that they had been fighting as like a pretty good three man unit on you know common thugs and stuff like that. And, Right. You know, it just seemed like they transitioned into this mission, and uh, fuck, it was a mistake to bring the kid. Yeah, you're like, oh shit, it's Ra's al Ghul. Uh, yeah, because that's bad when 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 he shows up. You, he got you, banged I, up. And uh, what about and the I, drain? Oh, oh sorry. On. No, the the drain pipe thing that was with the really water flushing in. Uh, stu was stupid, and also can't scientifically understand how they ended up in it. Oh, I see. When the cistern or whatever. Yeah, they got uh, yeah. Put, flushed down a water slide into a fucking cistern that was gonna pop their brains. Like, uh, I'm yeah, sorry, I, I'm, but I'm I'm not I'm not up on the math on how they ended up in that from water flow. But that's okay. Yeah, it doesn't. The map of what that place looks like, it's not clear to me. You know, it was just a bunch of mine shafts. Uh, no, like I can't draw that trap. Yeah, yeah, that's no, that's because confusing. it's stupid. <laughs> But, but uh, it was cool you know, to have them almost die from the pressure, though. You know, damn the physics. We're going to do it. Yeah, the, like uh, for that one scene, I guess the whole problem was worth it. And and one of the one of the powers and maybe we can put this on the list of, of Chuck's, you know, what makes these comics so good is that it moves uh, so quickly 
that you know you don't he doesn't give you really time to think about how fucking dumb it is um you know whatever scenario or, or words come out of people's mouths you know you're moving forward every page moves everything forward there's no lagging yeah uh, and and the dialogue did as well and the um uh it, catwoman was also trapped in the basement there that's weird. Yeah, that was a that was pointless. Uh, that wasn't his I mean, choice, uh, I imagine. That's maybe to just leave you for the next next issue or whatever. But. He was writing. He was writing Catwoman at the same time as this. Like he was writing all these books. Um, you, you know, him and um, I think Doug Boink or fuck, I have no idea how to pronounce that guy's last name. Um, anyway, he, him and another guy, I think, were writing the the vast majority of of Batman at this time, and so I don't know. Sometimes you just have some plot threads that you leave dangling and hope that you can deal with it later. <laughs> yeah, I mean his his uh, his dialogue was hokey, but I mean that that was a well produced issue. The the art was great. Was oh, I remember being so solid. excited, and the big reveal at the end. Like I honestly didn't think. Of, like I remember when we first read it. Like I guess we were sixteen, fifteen. And uh, I remember being surprised that it was Bane at the end and, and excited. And I was like, oh, fuck, the two supervillains are together. Um, yeah, I... It was kind of a letdown afterwards, but. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got weird. some exciting stuff for later, but yeah. Right. But, uh, the Bane was, it was a nice touch. I mean, you know, it made you want to watch the next fight, you know. Yeah. You know, Chuck gave us Bane. Uh, you know, always, re- always remember, you know, from the creator of Bane. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I yeah. mean, like it was, <laughs> Bane was a, that's a whole other thing though. If you want to go into Nightfall. Wow. Oh, I'm sure we'll get there someday. Oh um, yeah. I'd really love to touch on some of that stuff. I mean, I guess we're going to have to, I mean, there's, there are a lot of Chuck Dixon comics, but there's only so many, uh, I don't know. I'm not going to be reading Airboy. Or maybe we will. I don't know. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get there. First pick? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Do you have anything uh, else to say about? Uh, no, Detective no. I, Seven Up? I think we. I think we hit all the great moments. Okay. So yeah, man. Great comic. And uh, yeah, Chuck still an asshole. Yeah. So, agreed. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that we're going to be doing in this podcast is we're going to be figuring out our. Uh, so we're going to be covering uh, a, an X-Men story each episode, but it, we're also going to be you know, covering some other stuff. And uh, that stuff that we cover is always going to be a surprise for one of us. Uh, today, uh, it's James' turn to roll the D4, and uh, we've got four categories. We've got 80s and 90s comics. We've got general culture. Chuck Watch, where we talk more about Chuck Dixon. And then we got Classics Corner which uh, uh, we'll leave open to interpretation, but basically it's like, you know, classic comics moments. Um, And, uh, yeah, James is hopefully going to be able to roll a D4. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to do it uh, right now. Uh, If I can find that. Suspense. Ah, found it. Found it. Okay. Uh, Okay, here we go. And the roll leads to a three. Three? Oh, we're going back to Chuck Watch. Uh, okay, so so. Oh, I had three as general culture. Okay, well, but, uh, too bad. <laughs> okay, back to Chuck Watch. Wanna... I can surprise you right now for Chuck Watch. All right, so I got them all written out. Whatever your role was going to be. Okay, uh, okay. So... Well, we're ready for Chuck Watch then. Okay, so we're going back to Chuck Watch. We're going to do. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting project. We're going to do Team Seven Number One. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. And but, but I want to read it in conjunction with uh, Uncanny X Men three eleven, uh, okay. written by Scott Lobdell. Team seven. Team seven number, number one by yeah by Dixon and Weisenfeld, and then Uncanny X Men thirty one by Scott Lobdell and John Ramada Jr. Uh, basically, I want to place two hacks together side by side. And see Uncanny can... X-Men, which one? 311. 311, okay. So it's going to be Scott Lobdell, Scott Lobdell versus Chuck Dixon. Uh, I think we'll do a little compare and contrast. I already call this and, a hack uh, match. It's going to be, yeah, hack versus hack. All right, awesome. All right, so uh, so that'll be our next... Wow, uh, and, uh, okay. And then we're going to be... 
in the X-Men front, we're going to be covering some old uh, Uncanny X-Men, uh, issue 98 to 100, and then 112 to 117. Which is a little dip into the Phoenix Saga original. That's right. Yeah. Beginning and then a little bit of early Phoenix. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so the, you know, that's it. Okay. Awesome. And we'll got, wrap it up. You got any final words? Um, no, I'm ready for next week. All right, man. Well, until next week or next two weeks from now or whatever our schedule is going to be. Uh, you know what we didn't do, by the way? N- no. Introduce ourselves. Well, we did say James and James. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. We can talk more about uh, format and that sort of thing. But uh, until next time, I'm James. Uh, me also. Excellent. All Signing right. off. Now, all we need is a little energon and a lot of luck. Yeah.